Hi, this is lecture one, introduction to biochemistry. Now, this topic is divided into the following as shown in the outline. First, we're going to talk about an introduction using COVID-19 pandemic as an example. Second, we're going to, I'm going to show you a demonstration of a bioinformatics software called Genius. This is a proprietary software and how do we use it in our study of biochemistry. Third, um, I'm going to show you a demo on how to use a, another software, this time an open source software that you can download freely and install it in your own PC. Um, this software is used primarily for visualization of protein structures. Fourth, uh, we will be having a working definition of, of what biochemistry is based on different authors. And then the last one, we're going to take a look into the nature of biochemistry and how does it become a distinct field compared to others. So to start with, we all know that uh, our current situation, online learning, is the new normal. So this new normal lifestyle is uh, not only localized in our country, but as well as the rest of the world. So shown in the screen is, uh, is a map uh, telling us the distribution of the pandemic across uh, the different continents. So the dark red area shows confirmed cases per 100,000 population, that's above 3,000. Then uh, the lighter shades tell us basically small number of cases. So we are here in the Philippines, and then we can see that in the US, they have uh, a very high case of, uh, of uh, COVID-19, also the rest of Europe. Now, this new normal, uh, I have here another data, this time from uh, specific only for the Philippines. So we have uh, the data of September 24. We see here the number of new cases from the, from the month of uh, March, April up to September, we can see that from July, August, we can see that the number of cases significantly increased and it's still hard to tell whether we have reached the flattening of the curve or not since our number of testing is significantly smaller compared to our entire population. And then another graph is showing us the number of cases per region. So we are here in Western Visayas compared to other regions in the Philippines. Uh, Metro Manila has the highest, followed by South Luzon. Then we have Central Visayas, including Cebu. Then we have Central Luzon and, and Western Visayas as of September 24, which is today we have over 10,000 positive cases. So this is the current scenario of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this COVID-19 pandemic, or otherwise known as coronavirus disease 2019, we call it COVID-19, is attributed to the virus called SARS-CoV-2 virus or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Now, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 belongs or is just one of the members of the coronavirus family. Uh, basically, they are found mostly in animals and they attack the respiratory system. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 that um, turned into a pandemic originated from Wuhan, China in December 2019. And originally, it came from animals that mutated 
and is able to infect humans. So shown here is a picture, it's a 3D image generated by using um, advanced microscopy methods of a SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease. Now, it's interesting to note that SARS-CoV-2 virus is not genetically related with influenza virus. As we can see, the other 3D image, they have distinct features from one another. And genetically, they are not related. So it's important to emphasize this because the symptoms of the COVID-19 is similar to influenza. But in fact, those two viruses are genetically distant from each other. So right now, the current scenario is that this SARS-CoV-2 virus seems to be an invincible enemy. So in order, in order to help our health workers, our frontliners, our doctors, our nurses in containing the virus, we need to have a very effective strategy to do so. And in order to fight an enemy, first of all, we need to be able to to have different strategies or different approaches. Number one is to be able to detect. Number two is to find a cure. And number three, to develop a vaccine. So um, in the first method or in the first strategy, uh, the, 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 the only way that we can detect the presence of the virus is through clinical manifestations such as the presence of fever, uh, itchy throat, running nose, diarrhea, lack of sense of taste. Those are um, clinical symptoms that is used by our frontliners in order to isolate the um, potential COVID-19 patient, but that kind of method is quite crude because there are some asymptomatic patients that are carriers of the virus. So we need to, to do another method of detection which is more accurate. And this method of detection is, called, uh, is based on molecular methods. And the first one of these is based on antibody testing, so that's your rapid testing. But this kind of method is proven to be um, not reliable because it's only applicable for those people who have antibodies. So if that person is on its early stages of infection, it might turn out to be negative in the rapid or antibody testing. Now, a more specific method of detection, uh, which and is also the gold standard for today's diagnosis, is based on what we call the RT-PCR test, or the real-time polymerase chain reaction test. And this kind of test is based on the presence of um, RNA viral or uh, viral RNA coming from the COVID-19 causing virus. Now, how was this method developed in the first place? Um, when Wuhan researchers published the complete genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, I think it was in around January. So when that genome, complete genome was published, it was very, very important because out of that genome, other researchers were able to develop um, RT-PCR test kit specific for coronavirus. And... Uh, 
to show you the biochemical basis of the test, I'm going to open up um, the software. Okay. All right, so what is shown on the screen is a software called Genius. This is a, this is a proprietary software. Um, and uh, what I did is, is I went ahead and download the genome, whole genome sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The file name is NC045512. This can be downloaded in the NCBI website. And then once you have downloaded that, you can see that the genome is represented by arrow diagrams. And if we count how many arrows in there, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That represents open reading frame. There are 10 open reading frame or, in other words, protein coding regions. At the bird's eye view, the diagram doesn't mean anything. But if we look closer, zoom in, zoom in several times, you will see the actual nucleotide sequences or the RNA sequence of the virus. So you can scroll down and we can see the actual RNA sequence. These RNA sequences became the basis for developing the primers that is used to specifically detect the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in swab samples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out in this software and then I'm going to select the largest region which is which is named ORF 1AB or open reading frame AB and then I'm going to copy that region let's open up the text file uh, I'm going to copy that region and transfer it in the slide so this is a section of the ORF1AB. So now you can see that this is a segment of the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in designing a test kit, what researchers do, what, what biotech companies do, is that they select a specific region of the genome, such as the one highlighted here, which is, this is just a sample, and then they design primers or oligonucleotides that will bind specifically to this region. So once they have designed the primers, they incorporate that into the test kit, such as the one that's being developed by the UPNIH Manena Health Tech Company. So if you open up the box like this one, this is a used uh, uh, kit, you open up the box, it contains, all right, can you see the name? All right, so it's being flipped. Okay. So the box contains three tubes. One of the tube, the colored one, contains the primers that specifically detects the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So that's the principle behind uh, uh, how the virus is being detected using the published genome. So without the published genome, these researchers, this biotech company, cannot design a detection kit that will allow us to, to accurately detect uh, patients which are carriers of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that's one significant importance of uh, 
knowing the biochemistry or knowing the genome sequence of the virus. The second approach or the second significance of, of biochemistry with respect to COVID-19 is developing a medicine to counteract or a vaccine to counteract or to contain the spread of the virus. So, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, I have here in the lab, in the refrigerator, tons and tons of donated samples of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, detection kit. These ones are uh, from our hospital and uh, they requested if, if I could uh, or we could temporarily store their, their test kit while their uh, equipment has not yet arrived or while their lab is still being uh, developed. So the second approach, biochemical approach in controlling the spread of the virus is by developing vaccines or medicine to counteract the effect of the virus. And to do that, you need to have a strong background on the structure of proteins that is needed by the virus to replicate. So there are several ways of controlling the virus. Uh, number one, you can prevent the attachment of the virus to the receptor that is found on the outer cells of the respiratory tract. So you, if, you, if you can prevent the binding of the virus, that's one mode of uh, controlling the virus. Second, if the virus is able to get in the cells, you can prevent the proliferation of the virus by stopping a very important uh, process called RNA replication. So we all know that the virus basically is, uh, is a non-living entity. And for it to replicate, it needs a living host such as a cell. And for it to, re to, to replicate into millions of copies, it needs first to replicate its RNA or its genetic code. So uh, in order to, to prevent the replication of the viral RNA, you need to understand what proteins or enzymes are responsible for performing that. So here, we have um, an RNA polymerase or non-structural proteins or NSP derived from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Here is the side view. We have the top view. So this one is a SARS-CoV-2 RNA directed RNA polymerase or named NSP12 with other NSP, NSP7 and NSP8. So here you can see that this protein complex is the one responsible for copying the viral RNA and synthesizing a new RNA. So to prevent the spread of the virus, you need to target and stop the replication process. So if you're able to stop this protein, you're able to stop the replication of the RNA and the virus will not multiply inside the host. So this has been uh, one of the targets of drug companies. And uh, one drug that, ha had been, that has been approved for emergency use is called Remdesivir. This drug is or originally used for treatment for Ebola. But since we are in, pa in pandemic, it was approved by FDA as an as an emergency for emergency cases so how does this drug able to to stop the the covid-19 or to help the covid-19 positive patient well we need to understand the biochemical structure so basically remdesivir this is the structure of remdesivir to the right and this is the structure of rna okay so there's a lot of Sig um, 
similarities between the two. The first is the presence of nucleotide, uh, the presence of uh, nitrogenous bases. This one is a nitrogen base. This one is also a nitrogen base. They both contain a sugar, 5-carbon sugar. This is also a 5-carbon sugar. They have two hydroxyl group, which is a characteristic of RNA. And then they have a phosphate group. So when you have a, a base, a sugar, and a phosphate group, you have a nucleotide. But when you have two hydroxide attached to carbon 2 and carbon 3, you have RNA. Now, the mode of action of remdesivir, so basically remdesivir mimics the structure of RNA. So in, in a normal RNA replication, this is the form that's being added, added to the new uh, or to the newly synthesized RNA strand. Now, this is the form of uh, Rendezaber as a capsule or the pro-drug. Um, and this is the form of the molecule that attaches to the RNA polymerase binding site. So, either of the two can actively bind to the RNA polymerase binding site and terminate the viral RNA replication. Now, in this diagram, we can see that once the drug gets inside the body, it's being metabolized or converted into its nucleoside form. This one is without the phosphate group. This one is with the phosphate group. So basically, what happens to the original remdesivir is being converted finally into this form, the active form. And the final nucleoside triphosphate, you have the addition of two other phosphate groups. This is the form that binds to your RNA polymerase that stops the RNA replication. So the question is, why not use the nucleoside form and why do you have to use the remdesivir form? So um, the main difference between the two is, of course, the presence of additional functional group. So this is, this is the, the original nucleoside. Then you added some functional group. It was found out that adding this functional group increases the permeability to pass through the, the lipid bilayer. So without that functional group, if, if it is in this form, this is a little bit difficult to cross across the lipid layer. But with the additional functional group, there is greater absorption. So that is why the commercial form of Brindisiber is in this form and not this one. Okay, so here is another image showing uh, the incorporation of Remdesivir into the growing or the growing RNA, newly synthesized RNA is shown in yellow, while the template RNA is shown as a pink color. So you have here uh, Rendesiber at the end. Once Rendesiber is incorporated into the growing RNA strand, the replication stops because the structure is a little bit different from the, um, from the usual RNA uh, template. So we can see that the yellow one is shorter because the replication has stopped or have halted. It's shorter compared to its template RNA. So replication stop, the virus does not uh, multiply inside the host cell. So basically that's the mechanism behind the use of antiviral drugs. Now, uh, we are going to visualize the 
uh, structure of the interaction between RNA and RNA polymerase using the software uh, RASWIN. So I'm going to demo the software RASWIN. Then I'm going to open a file. The name or the ID name of that protein structure is 7BV2.pdb. So the file name is .pdb, which means protein data bank. I downloaded this file from the protein data bank database, obviously. You can Google that. So once we open this one, We have the protein shown as wireframe model. All right. So we can move it in three dimension. It's at this point, it's hard to see which is the protein part and which is the RNA part. So to help us visualize, we go to display and select the ribbons. Or we can try first the backbone. Okay. So in this model, we have the protein backbones without the side chains. And we can now clearly see the yellow structures, the two yellow structures, the helical structures. Those are the two strands of RNA. The longer strand is the RNA viral template, while the shorter strand is the newly synthesized RNA. So where is remdesivir in this molecule? So to help us visualize again, uh, I'm going to open the command line of the software. Then I'm going to select RNA. Once we have selected RNA, uh, I forgot some command. Let me. Then probably we can. All right, restrict. Sorry, I used the wrong command. So the command is restrict RNA. There you go. So in this case, we are only visualizing the double stranded RNA. So I'm going to perform a right click and then drag it to the center. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try and locate the presence of the rem remdesivir molecule so this part the longer part is the rna uh, template while the shorter one that's the newly synthesized rna but since we added remdesivir the copying mechanism have stopped that's why it's the shorter one so we're going to display it as a ball and stick there. And then I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to click right and then uh, drag it and zoom in. Command is uh, shift out. Okay. So I think remdesivir is this last molecule that I am pointing at you pointing on the screen all right so this is where remdesivir is added when the polymerase passes through it 
it uh, uh, it causes the termination of the replication process by some biochemical mechanisms. All right, so that's where rendisable. So you can see in the model that the template RNA is longer while the newly synthesized RNA is shorter because it failed to copy the remaining RNA template downstream. All right, so this is the Raswin software. You can download this for free. This is open source. Okay, so now you have seen the impact of biochemistry in the COVID-19 pandemic. We are now uh, at a point to um, look into the different definition of biochemistry. So according to McKee, biochemistry is the study of the molecular basis of life. It's the simplest definition. Molecular basis of life. You're trying to define life or to understand how a cell behaves at the molecular level. Then according to Stoker, another um, biochemistry textbook author, it's the study of the chemical substances found in living organisms and the chemical interactions of these substances with each other. Stryer defines biochemistry as the study of the chemistry of life processes. Pratt, our textbook, defines biochemistry as the scientific discipline that seeks to explain life at the molecular level. So there are many similarities in their definition. Um, but the common one is that the word chemistry and life. Okay? The word chemistry and life, that's your keyword. Now, based on experience, uh, an unknown author defines biochemistry as the systematic torture of students with copious, incomprehensible jargon, cryptic formula, and impossible, insoluble problems. I don't know who's the author. I have no idea who is this one. All right. So let us look at biochemistry at the prospect of an organism. So that organism can be a single cell, a single plant cell, or a human being. Essentially, biochemistry seeks to explain life at the molecular level and focus on the structure and function at the molecular level. So in your uh, biology, you might encounter this type of figure. This is the uh, structural organization of an organism. So for example, we have humans, then we have different organs. They perform uh, the same function. The organs are made of cells, basic unit of life. Cells are made of organelles. Each organelle has their own specific function inside the cell. Then the organelles are made up of biomolecules. For example, citrate synthase, which is an enzyme. Then you have uh, the citrate molecule binding to this enzyme. Then you have other examples of molecules being studied in biochemistry, such as ubiquinone and DNA molecule, my favorite molecule. So biochemistry is actually along this level, at the molecule level. Okay, so um, we don't do organelle and cells in organs. We leave them up to biology. The focus in this course is on the level of molecules. Which brings me to the disadvantage because since these molecules are so small, um, students tend to have a difficulty visualizing at the molecule level. So you need to have some sort of a visualization tool to appreciate uh, the structure of molecules. And examples of visualization tools are 3D models, which can be physical models or computer models. So that's where your RASMO um, and your Genius software comes handy because they allow us to visualize the, the genome, the DNA sequence, 
and the 3D structures of proteins and enzymes. Now, nature of biochemistry. Primarily, biochemistry is a chemical science. Based on my experience, now, it's a chemical science. Uh, this is my illustration from my experience of, uh, uh, of handling uh, biochemistry for the last several years. Imagine this uh, area, this blue area, as the field of organic chemistry. We know that organic chemistry compounds uh, involves the study of compounds that contain carbon, whether it, it's derived from living systems or it is derived synthetically from non-living systems. It's the field of organic chemistry. Within the field of organic chemistry, you have biochemistry. This, it's the chemistry of the carbon. It's the chemistry of carbons derived from crawling matters, or it's the chemistry of of carbons derived from living systems. And then inside biochemistry, you have a specialized field that focuses only on nucleic acid in its uh, effect on the cells in terms of phenotype. That's the field of molecular biology. So basically, molecular biology is still chemistry for me. So, so uh, I am explaining this uh, since I have the a doctorate degree in molecular biology. The, I found that the most effective way of understanding molecular biology is using the approach, understanding uh, the mechanisms in the language of chemistry. So biochemistry is mainly a chemical science. Now, what is the relationship of biochemistry and why do you have to take this subject as a biology major? Um, Biochemistry, although it is a distinct field, but uh, it has now become an interdisciplinary field. So the roots of organic chemistry and biochemistry are the same. The historical development of the field um, originated from the experiments that pertains to how urea was synthesized in the lab. So in this figure, you have... Uh, the intertwining of three fields. The first field to develop was the cell biology upon the invention of the microscope. So that was in early, early 1600. Then you have in the middle of 1800, you have the roots of biochemistry and organic chemistry. So Wooler synthesized urea in the lab. And then later on in the 1850s, with the classical Mendelian experiments, we have genetics. So when these three fields, cell biology, biochemistry, and genetics, this gave rise to a modern field called molecular biology that we know today. And molecular biology is the basis of modern biotechnology. So what makes biochemistry unique to other biology subjects is that you don't have uh, to memorize a lot of scientific names. You just need to be aware that there are regularities in biochemistry and that regularities or that trend um, can be summarized into themes. So what are the major themes in biochemistry? Number one, uh, biochemistry addresses or answers the question, what are living organisms? Organisms made of, meaning bio, biomolecule structure and function. The second theme, theme is how do organisms acquire and use energy? It answers that question. So this one pertains to biological thermodynamics. And third, it answers the question, how do organisms maintain its identity across generations? Pertains to DNA or RNA replication. So these are the three major themes or fields, concerns of biochemistry applicable across all different organisms. Bio biomolecule structure and function, thermodynamics, and replication. So when you apply those themes 
to all types of cells, you have a unified biochemical principles. Um, and these unified biochemical principles can be observed in all forms of life. First, cells are the basic structural units of living organisms. That's one principle. That is true whether you have a, a colony of a bacteria or you have a butterfly or you have this flower or you have this, um, um, I think this one is a dolphin, yes. So in terms of phenotype, they look very different in terms of size, in terms of habitat. But when you look at them at the biochemical level, they have a lot of similarities. And that number one is that they're all made of cells. Second, many chemical reactions take place in a cell which require regulation. So all of them have regulated biochemical reactions. Third, some fundamental reaction pathways are found in most cells. So for example, glycolysis or Krebs cycle, they have the, the steps are common. Uh, only unique to plants is the photosynthesis. All of these cells use the same biomolecules. So regardless of what type of cells, they have the four basic biomolecules. They have nucleic acid, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. And the last one, instructions for growth, development, and reproduction are stored in the form of DNA in most cases. Uh, exemptions, of course, are virus, uh, although virus is not regarded as a living organism. So these are the biochemical principles that are true to all types of cells. Now, we all know that in... In your general chemistry, we studied the periodic table. And as of now, there are more than 150, uh, I'm not sure, but most, more than 100 elements in the periodic table. But when you talk about biochemistry, we just limit our focus into several elements that are common, commonly found in cells. So in this table, you have uh, lists of most abundant elements in the human body um, represented as percentage dry weight. So we have carbon 61.7% followed by nitrogen 11%, oxygen 9.3%, hydrogen 5.7%, calcium 5% and the rest are essential minerals. So basically uh, cells are made up of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. So sometimes I, I abbreviate this as, uh, or I give it an acronym, or I abbreviate it as CHONS, C-H-O-N-S. I include sulfur. But the, mo the top four are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And if we look at their location in the periodic table, we have this one for biochemistry. This is the biochemistry periodic table, very simplified. Um, elements in dark sh shade are the most abundant ones. So again, you have hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The rest followed by some elements, sodium, magnesium. And the ones in lighter shade are trace elements. So at this point, um, we end this lecture, and then next meeting, we're going to talk about um, the four biomolecules and do a review on importance of functional group, an uh, important functional group that is relevant to uh, biochemistry.